My name is Jason Field. I'm the founder and CEO of BrainStation. Uh, BrainStation is the global leader in digital skills training and workforce transformation. Jason, thanks so much for finding time to join us on the Ivy Podcast this afternoon. Tell us a little bit more about your background, uh, high level uh, kind of timeline of the things you've been involved with. And then I want to spend a few minutes talking about uh, BrainStation. Yeah, of course. Uh, I guess first and foremost, thanks for having me on. Uh, hopefully the listeners learn something from my experience that they can apply to their own. Um, yeah, I, I guess career timeline, uh, things of that nature. Really, it's it's been um, an incredible decade, I, I guess, since uh, starting BrainStation uh, as the founder and, and CEO and continuing in that role. Um, I have a, a business background from an education standpoint and also previous experiences before starting BrainStation. Um, I think some of the definitive learning was actually before BrainStation where I, I took off on a one-way ticket to Beijing, uh, traveled through China, Southeast Asia, uh, ended up working and living abroad in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and that was about a year and a half total. So uh, I definitely don't want to miss out on the importance of that um, for any potential entrepreneurs out there. Uh, just taking yourself out of your comfort zone uh, has been really important uh, beyond my business background and work experience for my career. Oh, that's very exciting. And thanks for sharing some of the backgrounds about your, your journey so far. So tell us a little bit more about BrainStation and more importantly, want to hear, hear about the story. What led you to, you know, to, to make that happen at the end of the day? What problem are you guys solving? Yeah, definitely. Um, I like to many entrepreneurial journeys. I think the problem was one that I faced myself, uh, which was uh, I, I saw the, the economy taking off in certain categories with digital infrastructure really across multiple industries. Uh, this is about a decade ago, and even before that, obviously, the stats were pretty staggering. And during a global pandemic where everyone's living these digital lives, it's never been so apparent. Um, but seeing some of these trends a decade ago uh, had me you know, investigating the landscape for myself. Uh, I come from a business and finance, uh, you know, traditional educational background. Uh, I did learn some computer science through my business program, uh, that wasn't overly effective, I must say. Um, so I think it was it was coming from a, a personal desire to, I guess, operate in the world of business with the digital lens and not finding that learning opportunity that I was looking for. It was either, um, you know, going back to school and doing an undergraduate, a uh, college, uh, or university in computer science or or digital design or something like that. But really, all I was looking to do was understand and contribute to the digital economy, given I saw it more or less, uh, you know, eating the rest of the world, uh, as has been said. Um, so yeah, personal pain point, overcoming that pain point, started initially a, a meetup. Uh, so BrainStation before it was BrainStation was a meetup for, you know, really non-technologists looking to learn digital skills or technology in a, in a safe environment. And it was volunteer based with industry experts that came and kind of would teach lessons based on what our community was looking for. And very quickly, those you know, free in-person uh, lessons expanded from 16 people. Uh, I think the next one was like 38, and then it was 89, and we ran out of space uh, for these engagements. So that's where it all started. Um, you know, who is BrainStation today? Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, we're the global leader in digital skills training and transformation. So uh, going from a, a meetup, uh, focus on non-technologists to a, a global leader in this space um, has happened through a heck of a lot of hard work from the BrainStation team, paired with the organic growth of the awareness and desire for digital skills training. Um, we have moved from that meetup uh, through multiple phases. Uh, we now operate with 500 employees. Uh, we've trained 100,000 professionals across 95 countries around the world um, through both in-person engagements and online engagements. Uh, we deliver uh, boot camps or immersive technical training that's very much so like on-the-job training in programming or web development, user experience, user interface design, data uh, science, as well as digital marketing. And then we have a fleet of uh, let's call it continuing studies courses, uh, which are less boot camp esque. You don't need to quit your job, uh, and it's a little bit more about leveling up your skills as a professional. Um, you know, learning 
SQL or uh, Python or you know design thinking, these sorts of things. So ultimately, BrainStation, we're a digital skills training company. We empower professionals, uh, and we also work with organizations, businesses as well, um, as they're going through their digital transformation. Well, wow, that's pretty exciting. And I love the stories like that, where you just start out completely, you know, just totally unrelated, just a small group, uh, in your case, a meetup, or it was just a simple, you know, the newsletter, the email campaign that was going mm -hmm. out to a group of users, how, we, how it grows from there. That's super exciting. And in terms of, uh, you know, you've mentioned you've been pivoting, you know, in different directions as you started with you know, with the meetup to now being that's kind of the global leader in that digital transformation and skills training perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. What were some of the initial challenges? Because the reason I asked this, a lot of our listeners are not only executives and early stage career professionals, but entrepreneurs as well, who are, you know, either building their own products or building passive income organization side hustles. From your mm -hmm. standpoint, what, what were some of the initial challenges? How did you overcome that? Because from a standpoint of innovation, um, and as an entrepreneur, you gotta have that stamina to be able to identify opportunities and pivot the company. Share any insights from that perspective with us. Yeah, I, I think there is, you know, the the pivot of of the organization, which is today during a global pandemic, and you know the shifts and adjustments that need to be made that business executives. Uh, around the world of, uh, you know, companies of various sizes are making, uh, as well as entrepreneurs, uh, you know, pivoting or honestly introducing ideas based on some of the, the both macro and micro trends. Um, in the early stages, uh, you know, if you're at that scrappier startup stage and you're trying to validate your idea, I think it comes down to that, validate your idea. Uh, walk before you run, get up close and personal with you know, the potential customers that you think you have a business that revolves around. Don't just assume you have something that people actually want. I think while you know, it was more community-based and experimental and connecting people uh, to learn digital skills, it took about three weeks to realize that there was something here that hadn't been tapped into, that there were waves of non-technical folks looking to seize the opportunity that you know, we obviously are recognizing today. Um, so I think that realization was only possible because we were looking to problem solve, we were looking to create community. I would be in the actual physical space with all of these meetup group members, you know, they would be feeding me information, valuable advice, user research, et cetera. You know, we, we did programming with Rails, we would love to do iOS development with Swift. What do you think, Jason? And, that sort of connectivity in the early stages can't be overlooked. I think that a lot of entrepreneurs and startups, especially, you know, they'll go about raising a couple of rounds and they'll lose sight of the actual problem they're looking to solve and the people they're looking to solve it for. No amount of venture capital is, is going to help you in that category. You need to roll up the sleeves, get in there, ask questions. Um, and, and really you see it with the most successful entrepreneurs and business leaders, but you know, be customer uh, obsessed, be client obsessed, really understand them and, and the rest will, will take care of itself. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and from a standpoint of, you know, when you talk about the pivoting, it's also really more in a sense, understanding the customer needs and how you tie that to a particular problem that you, you know, you're solving and then identifying that, you know, that product market fit that we all after and be able to kind of to cater to that particular, you know, solution. I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's very interesting. We could probably spend yeah. the rest of the podcast talking about this, <laughs> but uh, when I keep moving on in a sense, with everyone shifting to, you know, the virtual hybrid modes, you know, with from the corporate sector to the startups and so forth. Um, what is your vision for kind of that future of work? Where do you see companies succeeding in this space? What type of model are you designing, let's say with BrainStation? Mm -hmm. uh, just, I'm curious to get your take on that as you guys educate, you know, thousands of people, you know, globally. Uh, mm -hmm. What's um, kind of, what are some of the things that you're observing? Yeah, I, I think it's varied. Um, I think regardless of the industry, it will be more dynamic and flexible. Um, I think certain organizations, industries, spaces are more well equipped for a digital by default or remote only, you know, uh, sort of environment. I think there are also organizations that don't have that opportunity and it doesn't make sense for the business. I mean, for BrainStation, we kind of hover in between. Um, you know, right now everyone is, is uh, you know, staying safe, come for their own home. Um, but we run 
uh, schools in cities around the world, including New York and London and Miami, with all of the operational requirements of you know, regulatory uh, uh, considerations, physical spaces, accident management, escalation processes, uh, you know, rent, all, all of these things. So I think it depends on the business. Um, I do think where pre-pandemic, all of the businesses were operating as if they were physically constrained and physically sort of um, led businesses like a school, which is in the physical. Um, I think those companies are now going to be free to reimagine their model in a new way. If you're not operating, you know, a manufacturing plant or facility, if you're not operating, operating, uh, you know, physical schools, these sorts of things, it really opens up the possibility. Um, and I think this pandemic has really just expedited the process that was already underway. And I think forced upon both, um, you know, individuals, professionals, as well as managers uh, and, and executive groups and owners into a state of there is no other option. So let's figure out how to do this properly. And oh, it's not actually that scary. Um, so I think out of this, dependent on the business, the industry, et cetera, there'll be a lot more flexibility and dynamism in terms of what the working environment looks like, what your day-to-day -day looks like, how work is quantified, uh, is it hours, is it output? Again, I think that varies depending on who you're speaking to uh, and what they're doing, um, but definitely different uh, than it was before. And I think we were on that path anyways, but I think we, we will achieve that you know, reality much sooner because we've been forced into this environment of you know, a, a big experiment um, because of a, a, a truly devastating global pandemic. Right, absolutely. And it's, you know, like you've mentioned, it's going to take a lot of experimentation uh, to identify what's really working for you. And I view experimentation as one of the kind of core ingredients of innovation. At the end of the day, this is how you innovate. This is how you stay ahead of the curve for, you know, observe some of the things that you implement. And that's pretty exciting. So definitely thanks for sharing that. Um, aside from the industry where you play in or the, you know, brain station, share with us any other ideas or trends that really excite you these days. So what do you think is going to be kind of that next big trend? Uh, what are you passionate about? Maybe perhaps what are you looking to invest in further? Uh, any insight there would be appreciated. Yeah, I, th I think the interesting thing is it's somewhat connected, at least the themes that I'm excited about. And whether BrainStation directly touches it or not, we kind of indirectly are part of this, which is you know, the decentralization and democratization of information. I mean, that can show itself in a work environment, that can show itself in a learning environment. Um, you know, it, from a brain station perspective, what I'm really excited about is, is we were doing online learning in a, you know, a real time format, like you and I are interacting right now in 2017. So well before the pandemic, and actually heading into the pandemic, about 50% of our learning in a, a live and real time environment was actually off of an online platform uh, that we've created in house. So I think the adoption of online learning paired with the awareness of digital skills, and we need more thinkers, builders, and doers for this digital economy, mapped onto you know, the digital adoption of remote work and you know, the decentralization of you know, knowledge workers and employees and businesses away from these city centers that are typically you know, seen as alpha cities and are very much so built up. It, it's all around this, this space of information and access to information. And you know, something I'm, I'm really excited about, uh, which I, I've seen some friends, you know, at their cottages, cabins, whatever it may be, uh, upgrading their internet to Starlink. And you know, gotta give a shout out to the, the team, um, the speeds that the, 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 the capabilities that have pr been produced. If you are you know, growing up uh, growing a family, if you're part of a family, if you're a, a, a young kid right now and you just got upgraded to Starlink, I mean, your access to information is totally different than what it would have been. And I think that sort of decentralization gets me really excited. And how I see that come to life at BrainStation is the amount of countries learning with BrainStation right now. We, we have 2,000 professionals learning in our courses and boot camps right now. We have thousands of professionals that come out to our weekly events and, and digital leadership panels. A lot of the stuff that really came from that original meetup group still exists. And there are people from 
uh, Senegal, there are people from uh, Israel, there are people from Australia, India, India, Pakistan, the list goes on, you know, 90 plus countries, it's phenomenal. But also in the cities that we operate in, there's someone that is three to four hours out of that city, and now they have access to top tier digital skills training led by industry experts. And they're aware of this digital economy and how they can contribute. And they're not just aware and they're learning the skills, but they actually get to apply and earn positions. So it really is all connected. Um, and I, I'm just really fascinated with kind of the future of work and, and kind of the intersection that I see BrainStation playing in, which is you know technology, education, and labor economics, and how those th three things are being fused together. Yeah, and that's you know those are very interesting trends, and especially kind of from from just ex accessibility standpoint to the you know you mentioned Starlink, those are very unique you know developments, and in, in especially mm -hmm. everyone shifting to remote uh, capacity, I think that becomes of you know almost an imperative uh, as mm -hmm. far as access to information, the speed mm -hmm. speed and all of that great stuff. So that's exciting, definitely. Thanks. I'm for also I'm also curious, uh, John. Another trend I guess related to that is. You know the space of real estate and i think depending on the city i mean miami is surging right now new york not so much you know boston surging uh other cities not so much i think we're going through a short-term sort of shift but i think a lot of the the media is talking about you know is it going to be suburbs is it going to be cities you know what size city etc I'm so curious to see what the distribution to rural markets looks like when you can work from a rural market, you can, you know, have a family with tons of land, uh, you know, good education systems through online learning, uh, you know, laser fast or, or, you know, fast enough internet to actually be a part of the digital economy. I really think that, you know, every industry is being impacted. I'm really curious to see how rural uh, real estate is going to be impacted. I don't think it's just a battle for urban versus uh, suburban. Right. No, absolutely. And, you know, there's so much opportunity in terms of I've seen when we talk about like the rural land availability and just utilizing that, you know, that space also for, you know, commercializing that in a sense, kind of like these, you know, as an example, like eco containers that people have been using mm -hmm. a lot to put up kind of these temporary uh, unique areas. What I, I found very interesting that I recently heard on another startup uh, podcast, they talked about building these mini communities uh for like specific area you know niche domains like whether that's a community mm -hmm. of you know graphic designers and they all cohab you know cohabit and live together mm -hmm. you know there's nothing better than just you know getting into a house with a bunch of like-minded folks and just uh building something together so that's pretty exciting totally um, from a standpoint of you know you being the founder of your company, the CEO, you, I'm pretty sure talent acquisition and surrounding yourself with the top people, A players, is mm -hmm. at the top of your mind 24-7. Whether you actively recruiting or inactively, you always, I'm pretty sure, on the hunt for great, great folks. So a few questions around that. Um, what are some of your strategies to really be able to attract the top talent to your teams and also retain them uh, to be able to keep those, you know, very niche, hard to find professionals. Uh, share with us any insights there. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, each stage of BrainStation has looked very different, the same way, you know, any startup scale up or established company would look very different. I think there is reality which the business proposition in those different stages is the right fit for different people. Um, so some people in the earlier st stages of BrainStation, it was the perfect fit. You know, it was a gritty startup, uh, bootstrapped, et cetera. Then going through a bit of a, a startup sort of growth phase and now very much so, you know, as an established business that's scaling up internationally and all these sorts of things. So I think just before I get into it, it's really, BrainStation has probably been nine to 12 different businesses in the last decade. And each of those businesses is more or less appropriate for the market uh, of talent, depending on what they're into, what they're interested in. And I think as a founder, as a CEO, uh, definitely a founder CEO, because you, know, you get to see many chapters very quickly versus a very mature organization. I think you just need to embrace that. You know, it's totally fine. People are into different phases of the business and, and that's exciting. Thankfully, we've had A players the entire time uh, and, and each phase we get stronger in different categories and, and the BrainStation team right now is just absolutely incredible. Uh, none of this would be uh, possible if it wasn't for them. And I think 
BrainStation, thankfully, is is in a space that you know I'm very passionate about, but so many other people are passionate about as well. So I think having a problem space that is really interesting, that is at the cutting edge, that does merge tech education and labor economics, I'm in a very fortunate space. You know, if, if I asked a, a room who's interested in empowering people and making education better, I mean, I think it would be weird for people not to put up their hand because we've all been consumers of learning and we all know the pain points and we all know that there can be improvements. So I think there's a little bit for BrainStation in some of the businesses in education or healthcare or energy. Uh, there's a bit of winning by default, which is, it's just a very interesting problem space. Now there's tons of interesting problem spaces and our job is, you know, work with BrainStation on education versus working with another, you know, innovative brand in education or working in healthcare or these sorts of things. So definitely the market is still competitive. Um, but I think operating a business that's mission back comes with huge advantages because people really do truly care. They're passionate. It's more than just a job the same way it's more than just a job for myself. Um, you see the feedback loop, et cetera. So I think it very much so depends on the business. I think offering that, that dynamism uh, in a working environment, showcasing that growth, promoting from within. I mean, we, we promote from within way more than hiring laterally. There are people that have been with us for so many different chapters. And again, that's that's us going from startup to scale up to a bit more of a mature business. So it's going to vary depending on the listeners. But I think people want to help. They want to be included. They want to work on, on difficult problems and solve them in teams. And if you create the infrastructure for that, sure, the you know the, the time off and the benefits and and you know the the meals and, and all that sort of stuff is great. That's bonus. But if you're leaning towards that to find and retain talent, it's flimsy. It's it's not going to be enough. I think you you need to tap into what people really care about when they're spending 40-ish hours a week, if not more, working on some mission. It's so much of their life. Do they care that much about what you're working on? Are they passionate? Are they more passionate than you? I love to see people that somehow surprise me in terms of like, I thought I love digital skills training. And this person that I just interviewed is like, you know, to the moon with excitement in terms of getting involved, et cetera. So yeah, I, I think it's just like uh, ensuring that everyone's working on problems they're excited about. They see growth in the company. They see the investment of their time and the difference that we're making. And thankfully in education and healthcare and some other spaces, the feedback loop that you see with students that go off to get incredible jobs and literally change their lives or, you know, in healthcare, someone that you know, gets cured and then goes off and runs a, a marathon or whatever it is, or changes their life. And other, like, it's hard to quantify how important that is. And I think I'm just fortunate enough to work with incredibly passionate, intelligent people that also share the same passion for education that I do. Right, right, right absolutely. No, that's very interesting. And in a sense, um, one of the concepts when it comes to talent acquisition that I always have to remind myself and, you know, relate to my team is, you know, hiring for strength versus hiring for that lack of weakness in a way that mm -hmm. let's identify first what is the key strength that we're missing on this team who can we bring on that brings a skill set that we don't have and mm -hmm. that's kind of oftentimes overlooked especially with you know in the technology that we're building for the talent acquisition and the staffing industry uh, i see that a lot where most of the interviews are more focused on what is it that I can tolerate uh, in this particular person that, you know, will, I guess, make me feel more comfortable when it comes to actually hiring them versus mm -hmm. where, what areas are they better than me or better than mm -hmm. uh, most of our team members that they can help us. So those are just kind of correlated terms that, uh, that you know, definitely thanks for sharing that. Um, and in a way, you, you being the CEO of your company, I'm sure potential candidates, they go through multiple rounds, technical assessments and so forth. But when they interview with you, give us a glimpse of the interview with Jason. What does that look like? Do you keep that pretty traditional? Do you get creative? Uh, and more importantly, what are some of the things that you look for in the responses? Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. It really depends on the role. And at some point I was able to have, you know, at least a coffee chat or a phone call or a FaceTime or whatever with every single candidate uh, that, you know, very quickly uh, a couple of years ago was, was no longer feasible. Um, but with so many other layers of leadership and stuff like that, it, it, you know, we're, we're definitely able to ensure that the right candidates are joining the team, they have the right support, we're assessing properly. However, I, I will throw out there right now, 
kind of where I hover is usually the, the areas that need to grow the most, um, you know, whether it's a new business, new products, uh, you know, new modalities of learning, et cetera, et cetera. So right now, a big part of my focus is on industry expert educators that are coming to teach with us full time. And many of them just come and teach with us for you know one or two years. They they sort of take a sabbatical out of industry, and then they go back to industry after you know empowering people and teaching for a little while. And I actually am the first point of contact that they have. Um, beyond a phone screen, they're scheduled into a, an intro meeting with myself, and the interview is a little bit you know turned around. I actually have a presentation that I go through in terms of who is Brain Station, what are we about, what are our values, what do we care about, and what is this role specifically well beyond what one can type in a job description. And that way, they have everything that they need from the CEO. They can ask questions first and foremost. You know, in the rare occurrence, they're like, this is completely different than I thought it was. Well, great. You know, we were going to have you in for two more challenges with a bunch of really senior people on my team that have tons to do. So, probably great that we got that, you know, out of the way and you have more clarity and we have more clarity. For the most part, I would say after that conversation, they're pumped. They are so excited to get started. They see the potential, they see where they fit, et cetera. So some of the interviews honestly start. Um, however, even those ones at the very end, I, I will be brought back in. And uh, I think they've gone through a bunch of the technical challenges and, and things like that for the department or the team that they're a part of and the hiring manager, the director, manager, whatever it is. Um, the last kind of interaction that I have is is really conversational. Um, it's it's usually, it's there's no framework. I, I, I prepare for each of these based on the individual, what I've learned about them, their background. I don't know, I do like 15 to 30 minutes of research and I'll create a conversation like we're having right now. And basically do, you know, an interview with the focus of just talking about some interesting things like, you know, through that conversation, I understand, are they actually passionate about education? Uh, what are their interests? Uh, what are their strengths? All these sorts of things. But it, it really kind of takes down that interview sort of feel and it makes it more conversational. Um, and I think there's so much to learn in that scenario. So I'm not trying to trick anyone or do anything abstract. I think we have some technical challenges and stuff that, that really do their job to ensure that we're hiring the best of the best. Uh, for myself, it, it really is getting into how they think. I think, you know, asking open-ended questions as you've done, you know, what are some of the themes you're excited about in technology? And that could be for you know, a coordinator of education operations. And it's like, well, let's, let's hear your thoughts. You know, I, you, you don't have to drive this in the business, but I'm just curious. And uh, I want to make sure everyone joining the team is curious and, uh, you know, thinking about these things and thinking critically and uh, good and abstract or ambiguous, uh, ambiguous states as well, which is the state that we're constantly operating in. So a lot more conversational. Uh, and I think some of the questions that I, I plan to ask in those conversations are a lot more strategic, but they, they don't come off as much as interviewing questions in the traditional sense. Right, absolutely. And I love that analogy that at the end of the day, it's also an opportunity for the candidates to understand you as a leader, to understand who is at the top of the company and how is that affect mm -hmm. them uh, personality-wise, culture-wise, and a lot of those great things. And it's exciting to, to hear that you're providing that opportunity for them to ask those questions and really have that dialogue versus really treating that as kind of that traditional interview per se. So that's very totally. interesting. Um, yeah, I, th I think I think it goes without saying, but you know, uh, people are the most important part of any organization, let alone an organization that is about empowering other people. Of course, our people are are vital. Uh, so there's no better place for a founder, a CEO, executives to spend their time than actually the initial interactions with the people that will be joining their team to actually drive that business. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's really about bringing on, as you mentioned earlier, these fantastic people that are more passionate about certain categories. You know, we have people that are obsessed with learning management systems that just want to build the best LMS in the world. I mean, I'm not that obsessed about LMSs. I, I, I like the big picture. I like the direction, but that's fantastic. We need that individual. So I just think from what I've seen with, uh, with different phases of companies, I think leadership spends too little time at the people uh, portion. Uh, in the interview stages, reviewing the candidates, et cetera. And when things don't work out or things are a little bit rocky or fall apart and or you know, they, they make offers and they don't get people to say yes on the other end of that, well, you need to start focusing on what really matters, which is these are the, the future leaders of your organization that are going to take it to levels that you wouldn't. 
And once you embrace that and focus on bringing on the right team, I think the rest takes care of itself. Right, right, absolutely. And last but not least, Jason, share with us, what is your content diet? Uh, what do you consume mm -hmm. on a daily basis? What are your sources for learning? Obviously, you guys are in the learning space. Uh, how do you educate yourself? So share with us any sources that may be useful for others. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think it, it varies a whole lot, but um, I, I guess I'll, I'll give a snapshot right now. Um, I have a lot of kind of the daily briefings that come through from various sources that I'm sure everyone or a lot of people on this call would have. I think that gives me a sense of you know, what's happening in the world uh, just out of curiosity and interest. It doesn't really always have to be like, what does this mean for BrainStation? Um, I, I truly believe in being a lifelong learner and, and being well-rounded. With that being said, I think those daily briefings, you know, in, in a, a couple paragraphs sums up what happened on a global level. Um, that day, I don't. I'm not on on Twitter, you know, searching for trends. I'm I'm not, you know, clicking on uh, different news sources and refreshing, trying to hunt for the newest and the best. For the most part, I will find out the big, big things that are happening, um, alike to anyone else. And I, I find it can be very distracting and take me away from uh, a level of focus that's required to run an organization that's growing so quickly. Um, I read The Economist once per week. Uh, I think that goes a lot deeper than some of the daily briefings, some of the, the like macro trends that have been happening for quarters, if not years, you know, resurfacing some of that stuff. Um, other things, I mean, I'm always learning something. I did data analytics last year. So some of the learning, the content is really, you know, through BrainStation, but I'm also learning outside of it, uh, outside of BrainStation as well. I got my motorcycle license last year. Uh, I learned to sail a couple of years ago. You know, I'm always trying to flex my brain in different areas. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs and, and business managers and executives solely focus on like, well, if I'm operating BrainStation, if it doesn't have anything to do with digital skills training and workforce transformation, then I can't digest that in my content diet. I actually think it's the opposite. I think being a well-rounded uh, thinker, uh, learner only contributes to the diversity that you bring to the table as a leader and your ability to connect with people from, from your organization that don't come from the same background, obviously, as you. Um, so I'm, I'm just constantly curious and, and trying to find different areas uh, to invest my time in. And um, sometimes it has nothing. I may never ride a, a motorcycle, period. Uh, maybe I will. But even if I don't, it was kind of a fun and interesting experience. And I, I feel it, it challenges me. And I, I would say for anyone listening, just find different ways to challenge yourself and specifically outside of things that make sense, quote unquote, for work. Oh, I love that. I love keeping, you know, a very wide portfolio of kind of the learning opportunities you create for yourself, whether they're unique experiences and so forth. As, you know, kind of we know about the, the famous three hobbies that you got to find, one that makes you money, one that keeps you fit, and the other one, I you know, there's different variations of that, but I like the one that, third one is one that makes you smart uh, in mm -hmm. some of the areas where you, you know, identify opportunities to become better, become smarter, so that's pretty exciting. Um, mm -hmm. Last but not least, what, what, uh, what do you, is there a book that you always recommend to others, and why is that? Yeah, I think... Um... I guess I've never met the listeners, so I can be a bit more generic, but I think whenever I make book recommendations to people that I know, I, 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 I like to take it away and, and give it some thought and kind of prescribe something based on what I know of their scenario, their energy, et cetera. Um, I'll talk about uh, a book I'm reading right now and a book that I just finished. So uh, I'm currently reading uh, Makers, uh, which is focused on um, you know, the revolution that is here and is into the future in the space of 3D printing. Um, I, I was aware of the space and we've had panels and guest speakers and stuff like that. Unfortunately, at BrainStation, I get to kind of just connect with some really amazing people. But 3D printing hasn't been as much of a focus for us. And I think reading this book has me really interested in what the next decade will look like for that, for nearshoring, for offshoring. You know, the pandemic has really exposed this distributed versus centralized supply management system and all that sort of, sort of thing. So I'd say checking out makers. Um, the other one, and I think that kind of fits into the category of one of the two categories that I like to spend actual hours reading about outside of work, which is beyond the news and, and kind of content day-to-day -day digest, which is like reading a book and sitting down for multiple hours and digesting that with purpose. 
And you know, the two categories, one is kind of with makers, which is futurists calling their shots on what's to come. And I just really like hearing what other people are thinking about and seeing these trends. Uh, and I, I like makers for that. Uh, the other one is I actually like looking to the past and I, I find myself reading a lot of books with historic context. Um, one that uh, I just finished uh, is A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, which is a classic. Um, but so much can be learned from, from reading what people were talking about, whether it's fictitious or not. Um, you know, th th this, in this circumstance, it's about the French Revolution and just seeing the themes that still exist uh, to this day, I think is really fascinating. So spending less time uh, you know, refreshing your news and hearing about what's happening at this second in all these areas of the world. And I think slowing things down, uh, spending time thinking about the future with those that have really put together a lot of thoughts and research on it, as well as looking to the past. What were we talking about? What are some of these stories? How are they repeating themselves? Um, and I think that's, that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. Well, I love these recommendations. Uh, definitely thank you for that. And for our listeners, we'll make those available in the episode notes. Jason, can't thank you enough for your time today. Uh, you, you know, very short, very insightful conversation. Uh, look forward to staying in touch with you. Perhaps we can do another episode next year. See how much you've changed, transpired. <laughs> so definitely thank you for your time today. Yeah, and, and John, thank you uh, so much for having me on. Really appreciate it. Uh, and thanks for listening, everyone.